morning. Glad to see everyone this morning. Welcome to Kevin First Baptist Church. Glad to see you. Let's just start with the praise. I'm glad we had a rain. <laughs> Billy, Billy Ray, can I get an amen? We got a good rain, so thank goodness for that. The Lord is taking care of us. Our crops are looking good. Uh, we'll call attention to our, our bulletins this morning. You know, we went to our new bulletin with the tear off. Now, the tear off is not just for visitors. If you're visiting with us this morning, there's an opportunity on there for you to put your contact information. Uh, Brother Tim could reach out to you if you so desire. But it's also for our members. We're using that for our prayer request. If you have a prayer request, you would please put that in. Now, we've never started back with the collecting of the, the offering as far as passing the plate. But we have one up here on the corner by the piano. And there's one in the vestibule on the table. So on the way out, if you would just drop drop your prayer request or your visitor information in one of those plates, and we do appreciate you being with us this morning. As we look at our prayer list, do we have any additions or updates to our prayer list this morning? Okay. Well, that sounds positive. Yeah. Tina Pavlik in a private room. So fantastic. Fantastic. Very, very good results from that surgery. All right. Do we have others? Do we have others? Remind everyone as we look down through there and we look at our nursing home and assisted care facilities. Uh, please keep those people in your thoughts and prayers. If you can, drop them a, a note or a card. I know it would be appreciated. All right. Are there others? All right, if you will, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and remembering these on our prayer list. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to gather here in your house and, and worship in freedom, and Lord, to worship the Almighty God. Lord, we ask for your blessings upon these that are on our prayer list this morning, and we know there are many others in the neighborhood that maybe we just don't know about, we lift them up, Lord, for, for your healing and your consideration. Lord, we pray that you be with our pastor this morning as we go upon our worship service, our special music. All those that are involved this morning in the glorifying of your name. Lord, I pray that you be with each and every household this week as we go up on the way. Lord, and guard and protect us and bring us back to the next morning. Amen. Yes, Leslie, you told me you had an announcement. Yes, I do. Okay. It's that time of the year when we're going to ask for you to help us out. In the bulletin, you found this little insert. We are going to start the Christmas backpacks. And uh, so uh, on the, on the left-hand side, you'll see the age groups and uh, the ribbons, the color of the ribbons you have to use. And then on the right is the items that are required to be put in the backpack. Now I'm giving you three options. First option is you can get a backpack and take it home, fill it, bring it back if you want to. Second option is if you want to just shop for someone on the, on the list. Only thing I ask is that if you do that, that you put a tag on it to tell me that it's a boy or a girl or what age group it is. And the third option is you can just give me money <laughs> and I will take care of it. Or anybody, any member of the WMU. That would be great. So we're going to do this through, the, uh, through August, the whole month of August, because then we're going to start the Christmas shoe boxes. International, send them off. So I'll tell you more about that later. But right now, that's what we're, that's what we're doing now. Uh, we don't have the backpacks yet, so they'll be here, and they'll be out there in the fellowship hall if you want to do that. So How many backpacks were filled last year, uh, we had a, we had a well, we got 15. They give us 15. That's what we're starting with. But I think we had to buy, I think we had about 18. And they were filled to the brim. So, Let's thank see, you. We'll see if we can go to 20 this year. I'll put that challenge out there. Let's see if we can go to 20. All right, thank you, ladies. <laughs> We got lots of youngins today. Come on. 
We're going to have fun. We're going to do something to Eli. All right, our scripture today is John 9, 6 through 7. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva. Now, he spit on the ground. What is saliva? Yeah. Okay. So he, he spit on the ground in the dirt, made some mud, and what did he do with it? He put it in the mud. He rubbed it on the man's eyes. He put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in a pool, in the pool of Siloam. So the man went, he washed, and he came back. And guess what? He could see it. That's right. The man was blind. He was born blind. Okay? And he had been, you know, I don't know how old he was, it didn't say that I saw. But anyway, when God made the mud out of the spit and the dirt, he put it on his eyes. Now, when I was a kid, which was a long time ago, <laughs> we did a lot of stuff. You know, dirt's actually good for you. You need to actually go out and just play in the dirt. Who's ever played in the mud? I have. It helps your immune system. It did what? It helps your immune system. It helps your immune system. Did you eat any of it? No. We don't do that. I'm going to make me a mud milkshake. Do y'all ever make mud pies? No. You never did make them. You never made a mud pie. Oh, Phil, have you made a mud pie? Well, y'all are missing out. Have you ever rolled down a hill in the grass? Yes. yes. That's awesome, isn't it? You ever played the cardboard box? Yes. 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 All right. Yes. Well, I don't have a pipe here, so I'm going to make a mud milkshake, okay? I'm going to have a little little water, a little mud, dash of salt. No, you don't have to have salt. You can have rocks and stuff. It's pretty good though. I don't know which one I'm ordering. Have you ever made a mud pie? Look at here. Boy, well, y'all don't know what you're missing. But you know, there's one thing you don't do. Drink it. Eat it. That's right. You don't eat it. <laughs> and you don't drink it. <laughs> you don't really think I drank that, do you? All right. <laughs> almost good, almost good. <laughs> Do I hear three? <laughs> All right. Making mud pies is one great thing you can do with mud. But in our Bible, Jesus does something even more wonderful with a little mud. Jesus was walking with his disciples when he saw a man who'd been blind since birth. The disciples thought the man was blind because he or his parents had sinned. But it wasn't because he and his parents sinned. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in his life. You know, when we see Jesus, some of the most times when we see Jesus at his most strongest, most powerful time is during bad times, isn't it? It's when things are bad and Jesus is there. Okay, so it wasn't because his parents had sinned. This happened because, so that the power of God could be seen. Then Jesus knelt down, he spit on the ground, he stirred up some mud, and he took the mud, and he put it on the man's eyes. He told him, now go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. The man went and washed the mud from his eyes, and he came back, and he could see. Come here, Eli. <laughs> Come here, Eli. Yeah, Don't you want to see better? You're not touching that thing. You're not touching that thing. You might want a big bite on my milkshake. All right. Well, you know, that man must have had a lot of faith that he let Jesus put that mud on his eyes. Because y'all won't even let me put mud on it. And I didn't spit in it. <laughs> okay, now listen again. This is this is a rerun of my last children's sermon. Now you would think that everyone would be happy, but the Pharisees, of course, they weren't happy. They never are, are they? And why do you think that they weren't happy? 
because Jesus healed this man when? On the Sabbath day. Remember the last time when we talked about things that you do on the Sabbath day? Things you don't do on the Sabbath day? Pharisees thought it was a sin to do anything on the Sabbath, even though it was to help someone. Remember we talked about rolling up on a wreck and a fire and all that stuff? When the Pharisees asked the man how he'd been healed, he told them that Jesus healed him. They became angry and said that God should be the one that got the glory. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. But you you and I and everybody knew God wasn't a sinner, knew Jesus was not a sinner. I don't know whether he was a sinner, the man replied, but I do know this. I was blind, and now I can see. I don't know what problems that you all may be facing, but I know that Jesus can heal a blind man with a little bit of mud, a little bit of spit. He can heal, he can heal me. He can heal you. He can heal any of us, whether it be on the Sabbath day or any day. Don't you believe that now? Yeah, come on. Y'all got to have a little bit of faith. Nobody will start. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I like that one too. Okay. All right. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the touch of Jesus to heal us. Thank you for letting Jesus be there in our time of need. Even if it takes a little mud sometimes. <laughs> We know that Jesus can always take care of any need or any problem that we have. Be with us this week. And thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, don't have any roll-ups this morning. <laughs> This morning we're going to do like we've been doing as we sing our first hymns 363. Would you stand please? And during the singing of this, would you walk around and welcome the people around, shake hands with your friends and those you don't like to, just go around, walk around, shake hands. Please stand as we sing 363.
time as you're sitting down, turn over to 375. 375 is our next hymn, first, second, and final standing. <coughs> <coughs> I said 375, it's supposed to be 374. That's what they were playing, now I'm saying something else. 374, the longer I serve him. Two verses. <laughs> Turn now to 446. 446, we're saying all three standards. <coughs> Excuse me. 446.
hymn this morning. Would you turn to 449, 499, as we sing about the victory in Jesus we have. I know a lot of you like it, so I'm going to ask you to stand one more time as we sing all three stands. <clears throat> Of 
praise unto you, Lord. But it seems I'm always falling by the way. Every time I've wandered from the place your heart would have me be, Lord, your grace becomes the eyes from which I see.
basically, I'll just share basic before I allowed Christ into my life. Uh, before I allowed Christ into my life and Jesus, I was in a bad place in my life. Um, mine is one of those typical stories. Um, <laughs> drugs, alcohol, um, chasing that all my gal or uh, missing out on important parts of my family's life, my own life, and it was given away from me. Um, many times my family would wonder from day to day if they were getting that phone call that either I was dead or I murdered somebody. Um, leading up to um, my my being saved, um, I think God was moving in me and Jesus, and that's what brought me here. I needed to leave the things that, that the devil was holding me back on. Um, when I came here, I, I, I started moving in a different format. Uh, things in my life started turning around. Um, I learned that I didn't have to chase the dollar. I didn't need those drugs. I didn't need the alcohol. I didn't need the party. I didn't need to have bad relationships. Um, I found a lot of encouragement in the Word, uh, in the Gospel. Um, I'm not well versed. Uh, as you all know, I'm a fairly new Christian, uh, about five, six years. Um, but I came here, it, I, I just felt the need to come here. I, I really think that's who brought me here was Jesus Christ. Uh, it was about a year after I came here and I became involved in the church and I started reading the gospel and coming to, to services and some Bible studies, uh, reading some on my own and looking at life in a different perspective. Um, looking at life as how I can rise above the mistakes I made. But in all of that, I felt love. The day that I was saved, it was actually surreal to me. Um, I always thought that people were saved in church. Um, I actually was saved one day. I, I just was looking down on myself, and I was sitting cold winter morning, morning routine, go sit on my, my outside deck and have a cigarette and a cup of coffee. I sat in my lawn chair, and I sat in that cold, sipping on that cup of coffee for about 20 minutes. I felt warm. I felt loved. Um, I felt happy. Um, I felt love for everyone else. I felt accomplishment. And that was the day I was saved. Uh, in that, how I've, I've moved forward is I've, I've not been afraid to take chances on career paths. Um, I'm more vocal as far as my feelings instead of keeping it bottled up inside that would cause the anger that I had before Jesus. Um, Many other things that I, I see now, like not chasing that dollar, because he still provides. Um, many of you know that I, I changed careers here recently. I took a pay cut, but I wanted to it with no worry because I knew he would provide for me. I, I, I put all my faith and trust in him um, because he loves us. I do know many Christians that ask me if I regret what I did in my past. I honestly don't because it's a constant reminder of how much mercy and love he has shown me over all, all the evil that I've done, um, that he has protected me from the devil, and he will continue to do so, and I don't doubt for a minute that he won't. He's very strong. Um, I have a stronger relationship with my family, um, primarily Lexi. I was a little rocky when we first got here because I was still adjusting to my normal being new. But little by little, every day, I just put more faith in him. And I continue to do so every day. Uh, I, I have a, a feeling that I, I really want to work with people that come from the past that I come from. And that's how I feel like he's moving me towards that path. And I'll, I'll find a way to get there, you know, to bring people out of that darkness that were in, in those dark holes with the devil, like I was so, so many years ago. And I believe everyone can be saved. And I believe us as Christians can contribute to that, that we can help everyone just by bringing them to our Lord. Um, and that's basically all I have. Appreciate Sabrina's story and her sharing. It's good to see you this morning. If you are saved by the blood of Jesus, you have a story. It's a story of a dead person coming to life. It's a story of grace. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of mercy. It's a story of love. And it's worth sharing. 
and every opportunity you get, run into somebody, tell them your story. And so we're going to look at somebody from the Bible. We uh, started to study last week what happens when you meet Jesus. And we're looking at, at people in the Bible, their, their personal testimonies, if you will. And we're going to be looking at a guy named Matthew this morning. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 27 through 32. Uh, if you have your bulletin, it's got sermon notes or if you download them off the YouVersion app, uh, you, can, uh, you can find them there. Uh, I post the link to that on Saturdays, and so that's available if you use your smart tablet phone to, to follow along with the notes. If not, right there they are. If you'd like to take notes, we've got room on the back as well. Uh, I'm a note taker, so uh, I know some of you are too, so there's a space for that. So let's look at our text this morning before we start breaking it down. I want to read it to you uh, this morning, Luke 5, uh, 27 through 32. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector, the he there being Jesus. He saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. There was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we thank you so much for this day. And Father, I believe that this morning that everyone here is here for a divine purpose. It's not by accident. And Father, I pray this morning that your word will, will find its place in the hardest of hearts. And that we will respond to your word. Father, may I get out of the way and may you take over. May I decrease so you can increase. And may your word do what only your word can do and that's change lives. And we will give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for you and you alone are worthy in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So who was this guy named Matthew Levi. This is this, number one. Is this is who I am? Uh, really, what little can be known about Matthew comes mostly from the biblical accounts of his calling. It's recorded in Matthew nine nine through thirteen, Mark two fourteen through seventeen, and then the text that we wrote from Luke's gospel, and also from the gospel book that bears his name. Matthew is a Greek name that means gift of Yahweh, and his Hebrew name, Levi, means disciple. So is it Matthew or is it Levi? And the answer to that is yes. Yes. Uh, it's not unusual for first century Jews to have both a Semitic and Greco-Roman name. It is likely this apostle's full name was Levi Matthew or Matthew Levi. Two things we do know is Matthew was a tax collector. And then he met Jesus and he became one of the 12 disciples, quite a life change for him. And when we were first introduced to Levi, we find him sitting in his tax collector's booth in Capernaum. Capernaum was a customs post on the caravan route between Damascus and the Mediterranean Sea to the west. So he had a good location to collect him some taxes. We find that he's a tax collector. Maybe uh, your translation, the King James Version, uses the word publican instead of tax collector. And they were called that because they dealt with public money and with public funds. Tax collectors, they were absolutely despised by their own culture because they worked for the Roman government. And they enriched themselves by collecting taxes from their own people, often dishonestly collecting excessive amounts. The Roman taxation system, it was an interesting one. The expansion of the Roman Empire led to a greater need to collect taxes. If you grow and your territory grows, you need more taxes. And there were three types of taxes, three main types of taxes that were levied upon conquered lands. 
One tenth of the harvested grain went to Rome. One fifth of harvested fruit, fruit plus a poll tax of 1% of all business incomes, that's what went to Rome. And when the direct taxes on individuals and their land was handled directly by the local government on behalf of Rome, indirect taxes such as tolls relating to the transportation of goods were farmed out to the highest bidder whom guaranteed to pay Rome a certain amount prior to collection. So they're like, we have this booth. It's going to be at this location. Who's going to bid the highest for it? The man that bids the highest, the man that can get us the most money, that's the one that's going to operate that tax booth. And whatever you collect above and beyond what you give to us, that's fine. However you get it, it doesn't matter. We don't really care. We just want our cut. So the publicans or the tax farmers they were fellow Jews chosen from the local populace due to their familiarity with social, political, and economic dynamics of their homeland. Anything collected beyond Rome's required amount could be pocketed. So those employed in this profession tended to rely on oppression and abuse to deceptively exhort as much tax possible for their fellow citizens so they could get rich. Nobody like the man who sat at the tax office. Nobody cares for the IRS, right? We don't like him, especially around April the 15th. This is a different kind of hatred here, though. The Jewish people rightly thought of them as traitors because they worked for the Roman government, and they had the force of Roman soldiers behind them to make people pay taxes they were the most visible Jewish collaborators with Rome. The Jewish people considered them extortioners because they were allowed to keep whatever they overcollected. A tax collector bid among others for a tax collecting contract. For example, a tax collector might want to have a tax contract for a city like Capernaum. And the Romans awarded the contract to the highest bidder. The man collected taxes. He paid the Romans what he promised and he kept the remainder. And because of that, there was a lot of incentive for tax collectors to overcharge and cheat any way that they could because it was all pure profit for them. Lane's commentary on Mark writes, when a Jew entered the customs service, he was regarded as an outcast from society. He was disqualified as a judge or a witness in a court session. He was excommunicated from the synagogue. And in the eyes of the community, his disgrace extended to his family. So if you were a Jew and you took a job with the Romans as a tax collector, your life basically socially was over. Your family, over. You couldn't go to church. Nobody liked you. You were hated. And also compounded to this, it was the embarrassment it had on his family. If you, I don't know if you think about this, but his name was Matthew Levi. The name Levi most likely means he's from the tribe of Levi, which were the priests. So Matthew Levi threw away his position to serve as a priest to become a tax collector. And that was the ultimate insult to his family. And this was the life that Matthew had chosen to pursue. He picked that. He, he bid for that job. But number two, Jesus called sinners to follow him. And this he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. The command was to follow me. Most people in that area probably knew Matthew. Jesus had probably seen him many times as well. It had been suggested that Matthew even followed Jesus because he drew a big crowd and there was a lot of opportunities to collect taxes. If you pushed a cart around, he could collect taxes on that. If it had axle or wheels on it, you could collect taxes on that. If you were carrying a basket of grain, he could collect taxes on that. It didn't matter what it was and what an opportunity because Jesus drew a big crowd. But if he was around Jesus, he had seen and heard Jesus many times. And he was well aware of some of the Jesus' greatest works. Just recently, a paralytic had been cured after his friends lowered him before Jesus through a hole that they had made in the roof of the building where Jesus was preaching. 
Earlier, Jesus had cast out demons and healed multitudes of hopelessly diseased people right there in Capernaum. But there he was in his booth, carrying on his business without any visible response to all these things that Jesus has done. But with two words, follow me, everything changed for Matthew. Follow me is a command to follow Jesus. It means walk the same road as me. So let's just take a moment here and picture this. Just imagine, just think about what just happened. Jesus is walking through Capernaum with the other disciples. The fishermen in the group probably knew Matthew all too well. There's archaeological evidence that fish caught from the Sea of Galilee were taxed. So Andrew, Peter, James, and John hated this dude because he'd probably tax their catches. The tax man that took money from them. One of the disciples? They probably hated him. But there's another disciple in the group by the name of Simon the Zealot. If the fishermen hated Matthew, Simon the Zealot was the one guy in the group that would hate Matthew more than any of them. Why was that? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Because he was a zealot? What's a zealot? Another excellent question. I have an answer for you. Well, the zealots were members of a first century political movement among Judean Jews who sought to overthrow the occupying Roman government by force. And because of their often violent tactics, the zealots have been called some of the world's first terrorists. Many of them had a reputation as forceful, aggressive agitators, and Jesus calls this tax collector to join their group. Jesus chose Simon the Zealot, a man who desired to forcefully remove the Roman government and a guy that was a tax collector. At that moment in time, as Jesus walks by with all his disciples and he looks at Matthew and he says, follow me, Simon the Zealot's probably hand on knife saying, what? I will cut him. Jesus? That guy? What are you doing? You can't allow that guy to join our group. They were natural enemies. But Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. And they were part of the 12. And if you look at the background and you look at the structure of the 12 disciples, it is a beautiful illustration of the peace that Jesus brings. And I just imagine Jesus was just like this. You remember when he sent them out two by two? He probably paired Matthew and Simon the Zealot. You guys, your roommates, buddies, go together, work it out. And we find that Matthew leaves everything behind. This is what happened when I met Jesus. This is what happened. And it's nearly identical to what we saw Peter, James, and John do when Jesus gave them the same command to follow me. They left their boats. They left their nets. They left their father. They left the fish to follow Jesus. And Levi does the same thing here. He left his tax gathering booth. He left all the money. He rose up and followed Jesus. This was a once in a lifetime opportunity to Levi. And he knew it was better than anything that he could ever do with his life. On the one hand, he could continue to be a tax collector, earning piles of money, but he could continue to have everybody hate him and despise him, or he could leave all his money behind and follow Jesus where there was love, acceptance, and most of all, forgiveness. It's not even a choice he had to think about. He just got up, he left it all, followed Jesus, no two weeks notice, gone. If you happen to be wondering what happened to his booth, you just can't leave like that. You just can't leave a job like that. Yes, you can. Back when I was in college, don't judge me for this story. 
was a different person. Back when I was in college, I had a, I had a buddy that I lived with. We lived in a house and he had a job of valet parking cars at one of the bigger clubs in Lexington. He says, hey, it pays pretty good money. We need help, would you help? I'm like, sure. How hard can that be? People come in, they give me their car keys, I park their cars, drunk people come out, I get their cars for them, right? That was it. And it was in the winter time. We park cars and we park cars on a Friday night. We park cars and park cars and it started to snow. So we got the bright idea, of, hey, we'll clean everybody's cars off. Drunk people come out of the bars, they get big tips because they don't have any idea what they're doing. <laughs> but we made a lot of cash that night. Next night, it had snowed and snowed and snowed. It was rough. I show up for work on Saturday night, buddy, nowhere to be found. And it was cold. And we had that little ballet thing that you stood behind the little counter, you had the keys in there and everything. And there was about three cars there that night. And I was thinking, Tim, it's cold and you don't need this. So you know what I did? I got in my car and I left. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't give them any notice. I didn't give them a phone call. I didn't send them a postcard. The people that's parked there, they can get their own keys. They can sort through them underneath the counter. I just left and I was out. I never went back. Listen, when Jesus calls, he just left. He just left. He, he, he left it unattended. He didn't really care about what was gonna happen. But here's the thing, his boot didn't stay empty long because there was a long list of men willing to do anything for money. And they filled it fast. So in our text, we have this scene change in verse 29. We go from the streets of Capernaum to Matthew's house where he's throwing a party and Jesus is the guest of honor. Number three, Jesus fellowships with sinners. And Levi made him a great feast in his house and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at tables with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Letter A, we are to ask everyone to follow Jesus. We are to ask everyone to follow Jesus. After Levi had quit his job, one of the first things he does is to have a party for Jesus and invite a bunch of other tax collectors. Why tax collectors? Well, that's the only people he knew. That's the, only, that's the only people knew. He didn't know any of the religious people. He didn't know any of the social elite. He didn't know any upright and socially acceptable people. He was shunned by everyone in the community, probably even his own family disassociated with him. And the only friends he had were other tax collectors. So Levi got together the only friends he had and he invited Jesus over for a meal. Levi has found what he was looking for in Jesus. And he wants to share Jesus with as many of his friends as he can. Listen, a saved man doesn't want to go to heaven alone. A saved person, listen, we can't be selfish with it. Levi brought Jesus a crowd that would never hear him in the synagogues. Sometimes we have this mindset that, you know, people, are just, we just like open our doors and say, hey, y'all come, y'all come, y'all come. Listen, the reality is, is that's not going to happen. Jesus went to where the people were. And these people that Matthew brought, they weren't going to go to church. And, and the reality is this, most lost people will never come to church. They will never attend an event. They will never uh, watch our live stream services. They will never subscribe to our YouTube channel. They won't. We are to go to them. We are to ask everyone to follow Jesus. We are to go out to the roads and the country lanes, the highway and the hedges, and compel them to follow Jesus. Letter B, we are to accept anyone willing to follow Jesus. If you notice, there's the term sinner used there. And automatically when we, we hear the word sinner, we have this idea of what that is. But the term sinner used here refers to not only to immoral and pagan people, but the Pharisees, they used it to refer to common people 
who were not learned in the law and did not abide by the rigid standards set by them. If you didn't know the law, or if you didn't abide by the standards that they had, you were a sinner. That's, that's, that's a term that they use. The Pharisees view them as trash, and anyone that would accept them was trash also. Church, we need to get excited when anyone, no matter who they are, what they look like, where they come from, when they accept Jesus, we need to get excited. Because at that point, they become our brother and sister in Christ. We need to love them, disciple them, and help them grow in the faith. See, we don't get to choose who comes to Christ. But we can be so self-righteous and so obnoxious as Christians that we can turn people off of Christ. There's a line from a Casting Crown song called, If We Are the Body, it says, Jesus paid much too high a price for us to pick and choose who should come. We don't get to do that. We ask, we accept, and let her see we're to associate with those who don't follow Jesus. We can't reach the lost if we avoid them. You, you can't share the gospel with lost people if you're never around them. Studies have shown that those who are most effective in evangelism are those who have just started following Jesus. Why is that? Well, because they still have friends who are not Christians. When they believe in Jesus for eternal life and they discover that he forgives them for all of their sins, they love to tell their friends about it, just like we see Matthew doing here. They may think you're crazy. They may run away from you and avoid you after that, but you have shared the gospel. But what happens is the longer one is a Christian, the fewer non-Christian friends he or she has. So the evangelism tapers off. This is why it's important to make sure that we maintain contact with non-Christians and we continually show compassion for them. We do not take part in their sin. We do not condone their sin, but we do need to be part of their lives in some capacity. When we follow Jesus, Jesus also wants to follow us into our homes, our workplaces, and among our friends. You see, Jesus had no problem about sitting down for a meal and enjoying his time with those who socially consider the sinful people. We look at this feast that Luke writes about, and he says there was a great number of tax collectors and others. From a cultural viewpoint, the bottom of the social order was this. Sinners, really bad sinners, scum of the earth, lower than the scum of the earth, murderers, Roman tax collectors, then Jews working as tax collectors for Rome. That was kind of where they were at. That was where these guys were at. A tax collector was on the same level as a prostitute. And the religious people and the upright citizens, they didn't want to have anything to do with them either. But Jesus loves both and shows compassion towards both. And here we see him sharing a meal with the tax collector. And we look how the religious rulers react in verse 30. The scribes and the Pharisees, they were so concerned with remaining separate from sinful society that they would never allow themselves to get near somebody that they thought was sinful. They believed in guilt by association. They did business as much as possible only with other Pharisees. When they traveled, they stayed with other Pharisees. They lived inside a Pharisee bubble. Talking with a sinner or touching a sinner was bad enough, but sitting down and sharing a meal with them was about the worst thing that you could do. And in their minds, sitting and eating with a sinner was the same thing as endorsing the sin. So they condemned Jesus. They condemned his disciples. They say, what is he doing? If, if he wants to be respected and well-liked in society, he needs to hang out with different people. He's never going to up his social status by hanging out with these guys. He needs to be like hanging out with us if he wants to be somebody. If he wants his ministry to be anything at all, he needs to come hang with us, not with these people. 
Their message to people outside their little legalistic bubble was that people need to believe like them, dress like them, act like them, like what they like, and don't like what they don't like in order to be accepted. Sounds like Christians sometimes, doesn't it? The assumption sometimes we make is that only people who are genuinely interested in God are those who are interested in church and the way we do Christianity, but that is not true. I've often wondered this many times in my little peanut head, if Jesus would fit in at some churches today. You see, Jesus did completely the opposite of many Christians today. He reached out to people that everybody, both the Pharisees and the society, considered sinful. And he did it in a way that offended the Pharisees. He certainly didn't join sinners in their sin, but he did join with them in other ways so that he could get to the heart of the matter, calling sinners to repent from their sins. There are many people that all of us come into contact with who may never come to church unless we go to them first. That's what Jesus did. If we are Christ's followers, we will do the same thing. You see, Christ is teaching his disciples how to be fishers of men. And the fishing tip he gives them here is if you want to catch fish, you go where the fish are at, right? If you want to catch fish, you got to go to where the fish are. Number four, Jesus calls sinners to repent. And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. When Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house with many other tax collectors and sinners present, the Pharisees questioned the disciples about Jesus' choice of companions. And Jesus' response here is one of the clearest explanations of God's heart and his gospel to man. It is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus came to save those who knew they were not good. The people who freely admitted that they needed salvation. Not the righteous, the self-righteous that thought they were okay. Of course, there are a lot of sick people out there who think they're just fine. And similarly, there are a lot of sinners out there who think they're pretty good people. And it is impossible to save a person who claims they don't need saving. But what Jesus does here is he draws an analogy between the sick and the sinners. When you're sick, you go to the doctor. You seek out help. You expect the doctor to give you medicine or to tell you something to change in your lifestyle that will help your health improve. He said, I've come to call sinners to repentance. Jesus has come to help those who know they are sinners. Jesus, just as healthy people don't need doctors, righteous people don't need repentance. And I want you to please, please hear me on this. Don't think for a minute that just because Jesus associated with sinners that he was okay with their sins. He hates sin and he will judge sin. Psalm 5.5 5 says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. Psalms 11.5, The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Proverbs 8.13, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. You see, Jesus was not saying, Hey guys, I get it. You, you've got to make a living. I understand that. You've got to provide for your family. Hey, guys, I understand that you're just human and you can't help it. Hey, guys, I'm cool with what you're doing. You didn't see Jesus say, hey, let's go. I'm going to just like, we're going to knock down a few beers and hang out and drink. And we're going to talk about Bible stuff. That's not what Jesus did at all. Because he hates sin. That's why he came. Jesus calls sinners to repent and to stop living in their sinful lifestyles. He tells the adulterous woman to go and sin no more. He forgave her, but he didn't say, hey, it's okay to return sleeping around with married men. I get that. He said, stop sinning. 
In John 5, 14, he tells the lame man that he had healed. He says, see you're well, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. He says, I saved you from that destructive life and I'm giving you a better life, way better than you could ever imagine. Don't go back to the mud. Stay out of it. Jesus' desire for you and for me after we have repented of our sins is to live lives that are holy and pleasing to him. We cannot merge or morph the old life and the new one together. We are not to keep sinful habits and act like God is okay with it because he's not. Cultural Christianity. I've been to a few countries and, and it's not like that in those few countries, but I haven't been to all the countries, so I can't speak on behalf of all the countries, but I can compare America to the countries that I've been. And this country is the only one that acts like we can hang on to the old lifestyle and hang on to Jesus at the same time. That's not how it works, church. Jesus has called us away from all of that. We kind of, kind of like, we're going to do our own thing. Yeah, I'm saying, look, I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to keep on like hanging on to this. I'm going to keep on doing this. I'm going to keep on running with the, the crew, right? I'm going to keep on just the old habits. That's, that's not how salvation works. Jesus calls sinners to repent. He recognized those who were in desperate need of salvation and he offered them something far better than what they had. He offered them himself. He's like, look, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The outcast, the downtrodden, the beaten down, they came to him in groves. They, they, they were always around him. And when they came to him for help, he didn't give them some purple grape flavored placebo to make them feel better about themselves for a few hours. He didn't try to cover over the effects by giving them some painkillers and nice music to listen to. He is the great physician. He goes right for the root of the problem, he gives them the cure. He tells sinners that their problem is sin and they need to stop sinning. And when sinners come to him for help, he tells them to repent. And although Jesus wants you to follow him, no matter what sin is in your life right now, he doesn't want you to remain in that sin. He wants you to become aware of it and repent of it. Jesus wants you to follow him. And this passage speaks to us today just as it spoke to that room full of tax collectors. Don't ignore or excuse sin. Don't try to treat yourself either. This is not a home remedy that you can find for sin. You can't Google WebMD for a treatment. You need to go to the great physician, which is Jesus Christ. And number five, this is how I was changed. So what happened to Matthew? What happened, you may ask? Well, when called by Jesus, Matthew immediately left his tax collector booth and followed the Lord. He left behind the source of his riches. He left his position of security and comfort for traveling. He left it for hardship and eventually martyrdom. He left his old life for a new life with Jesus. As one of the 12 apostles, Matthew was there throughout almost all of Jesus' ministry. The only people who probably saw more of Jesus was uh, and what he was capable of were Peter, James, and John. Matthew is considered one of the four evangelists. This is a little a title reserved for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the author of the four gospels. These four writers proclaim the good news of Jesus with their writings. And the historian Eusebius, he mentions Matthew having gone beyond a Jewish audience and some have suggested he ministered as far as Ethiopia and Persia. And the earliest traditions have Matthew martyred for his faith, either by burning at the stake or being executed by a spear or sword. From tax collector booth, this is who I was before I met Jesus. To the call to follow me, this is what happened when I met Jesus. And this is who I am now. A disciple of Jesus, a writer of the gospel, 
and a martyr for the faith. What would you give up to follow Jesus? What would you give up to follow Jesus? About 150 years ago, there was a great revival in Wales. And as a result of this revival, many missionaries came to Northeast India to spread the gospel. The region known as Assam was comprised of hundreds of tribes who were primitive and aggressive headhunters. Into these hostile and aggressive communities came a group of missionaries from the American Baptist missions, spreading the message of love, peace, and hope in Jesus Christ. They were not welcome at all, but one missionary succeeded in converting a man, his wife, and his two children. And this man's faith proved contagious, and many villagers began to accept Christ. But the chief, the village chief, was angry, and he summoned all the villagers together, and he then called the family who had first converted to renounce their faith in public or face execution. And moved by the Holy Spirit, this man said, I have decided to follow Jesus. And enraged at the refusal of the man, the chief ordered his archers to arrow down the two children. And as the boys lay twitching on the ground there, the chief asked, will you deny your faith? You have lost both your children. You will lose your wife too. But the man replied, though no one joins me, Still, I will follow. The chief was beside himself with fury, and he ordered his wife to be arrowed down in a moment. She joined her two children in death. And now he asked for the last time, I will give you one opportunity to deny your faith and live. In the face of death, the man said the final memorable line, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. And he was shot dead like the rest of his family. But with their deaths, a miracle took place. The two chiefs who had ordered the killing was moved by the faith of the man, and he wondered, why should this man, his wife and two children, die for a man who lived in a faraway land on another continent some 2,000 years ago? There must be some remarkable power behind the family's faith, and I, too, want to taste that faith. And in a spontaneous confession of faith, he declared, I too belong to Jesus Christ. And when the crowd heard this from the mouth of their chief, the whole village accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those lines that that man uttered, you may find them familiar. The song is based on the last words of Nak Singh, a man from the Garo tribe of Assam, India. And it goes, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Church, what would you give to follow Jesus? Would you stand with me and close your eyes and bow?